Hello ladies and gentlemen, once again this is Jeremy Smith. Recently I had a chance to take a quick look at Tamron's new 35 to 150 lens. Uh, this is the new e-mount variation and it is an f2 on the wide end and an f2.8 on the long end. And this is an incredible lens. Uh, this is incredible news for e-mount users because now we have uh, what has become the fastest e-mount zoom available. And this reminds me quite a lot of Canon's 28 to 70 f2 for the RF mount. Now this lens is not f2 all the way through. It is a 2 to 2.8 as I mentioned. But the good news is that gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, we are exchanging a little bit of the speed on the long end uh, in order to have, well, a longer long end. You know, instead of going out to just, uh, instead of being just shy of the portrait focal length range, which I consider to be around 85, we can actually go up to 150, which is very, very nice. Uh, now this lens, is a lens I saw a lot of the other people sort of doing some initial testing on. Um, for me, this is a lens that really, really speaks to video shooters. So the first thing I did was give this lens some testing uh, with video in mind. Uh, now, a lot of folks have done some focus breathing testing with the lens, and they shot at like 35 millimeters, and I did the same thing and realized that the lens has no focus breathing. This is something that you guys probably already know because you've seen a lot of these videos. Um, but I also wanted to test it at the longer end as well. And even at 150, I was pleasantly surprised to note that this lens also is surprisingly focus breathing free, even at that longer focal length. So if, you, if you're the type of video shooter that hates focus breathing, uh, me personally, it doesn't really bother me for the type of shooting that I do. Um, but if it does bother you, know that this lens really does well in that area. Now, focus speed wise, this is not a lens that's going to compare with some of the uh, like really fast Sony G Master lenses with their linear focus motors. Uh, so like I'm filming this video with a 35 1.4 G Master right now. Now you guys may have seen my video comparing that to Sigma's 35 1.4 DGDN. If you haven't seen that video, check it out. Um, but yeah, this, this new Tamron is not quite as fast focusing as something like that, uh, that Sony lens, but with its stepper motor design, it's still pretty quick and it's still very, very silently focusing. So it does good in that area as well. Now, another thing that I was just kind of personally curious about after I was doing all these different sort of like video tests, I was curious to see how this lens, uh, performed in terms of, um, I wanted to see whether or not it was uh, par focal or not. Uh, meaning that, uh, does the lens actually change focus after you zoom? And this lens is not par, par focal. Um, you can see that whenever I zoomed uh, to one part of the range and focused the lens, whenever I refocused the lens, it did not stay in focus. So definitely not par focal. Uh, now, one lens I am gonna mention in this video quite a lot is Sony's new 70 2.8 G Master uh, version two. And uh, that lens does make the claim of being par focal. I'm very eager to test that in a future video and see how that uh, works out. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this Tamron lens and we'll look at uh, a few more aspects of it in more detail. Taking a closer look at the Tamron 35 to 150, you will notice that it is certainly a very, very large lens. Uh, but this shouldn't be a surprise when we're talking about a lens that starts at f2 and goes to f2.8. As we look at this up close, we'll notice that we have a lot of, uh, lot of focus hole buttons. <laughs> uh, more than any I've ever seen, uh, or more than I've ever seen on a lens in this range. You will notice that we have them in several positions here. We also have our autofocus and manual focus switch, and we have this customizable switch position here that you can basically preset different lens parameters to. Now, in the past, we used Tamron's tap-in console to customize lenses, but that was never something that was a thing on Sony E-mount Tamron lenses. But on this one, we have a unique way of customizing it, and that is with this USB-C port. And apparently Tamron, they have a new software package that is designed to be able to customize this lens via this port. Write me in the comments below if you'd like me to test that. Let me know what you'd like to see, and I will see about this in a future video. Now, I did find that this was very interesting because this lens does have weather sealing. You know, it does actually have the ability uh, 
to uh, you know have a little bit of a seal here at the mount. But I do kind of wonder how having this open USB-C port affects things. I noticed that on Tamron's new 28 to 75 uh, version 2, that lens also has the same USB-C port. It would have really been nice to have some type of like cover or gasket or seal or door or something over this. But anyways, we don't. Yeah, really, really large lens. I keep switching hands because it is heavy. Um, I'll take this hood off. You can see that we do have a 82 millimeter filter thread here. Now, in terms of weight, it's hard for me not to mention the weight. It is the same size. Um, it's several of Sony's other lenses, very similar in size, I should say. This is the 135 1.8 G Master right here. This is the 85 1.4 G Master. So it's very, very similar to those in terms of its size and dimension. Weight-wise, though, it is certainly heavier than these. Um, it's actually heavier than Sony's new 70 to 200 2.8 G Master version 2. So it is heavy. <laughs> um, I think, though, that if you're traveling and you're wanting to eliminate carrying several primes, I also don't have the 51.2 up here as well. Um, and I don't have the 35.14 up here because I'm filming the video with that. But yeah, it would take all those lenses to cover this one. So if you're traveling, you know, while this lens is very heavy, you would certainly save a lot of weight in the back. Now, shooting with the lens, it's very, very front heavy on the camera. So yeah, that's an area where you might really, you know, you might really start to feel that weight. Write me in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. I'm going to do some more testing on this lens. Um, I wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to do a lot of sample images and everything, but um, we'll go ahead and look at some of the samples that I did come across, and I'll give you a little bit of my initial thoughts. Okay, guys. So unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to do a lot of shooting with this lens, but I want to just kind of briefly show you a few of my findings. Um, Basically, the gist of my findings is that this lens has excellent bokeh performance, uh, basically on par with some of the best primes that are made. Um, it's extremely sharp at 35 millimeters. Um, at the long end, it's a bit softer, but only when you pixel peep really, really hardcore. So that's the gist of it. But I'll show you briefly here. Um, very, very beautiful subjects I was photographing at 1130 at night. But uh, yeah, 35 millimeters here, F2. Uh, these are all shot on the A1 in electronic shutter mode, so there's no additional like shock caused by any shutter mechanism or anything. And uh, yeah, you can see very, very sharp here. Um, I haven't examined the edge sharpness too much, and I will probably do that in a future video. So yeah, you guys will definitely have to check back for that. But it looks good there. If we go out towards the long end, you can kind of see, if we zoom in here, so not quite that close. Doesn't look too bad. You kind of can see a little bit of softness if you're, if you're a pixel peeping maniac. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, is this because I'm super, super close? Maybe I should try a different uh, subject distance. So I ended up shooting back a bit further like this. Now this is at 86 millimeters. If we zoom in, you'll notice that it looks it looks pretty darn sharp, right? Yeah, I think so. But if we're shooting at something like, say, 150, we see a little bit less sharpness here. It's ever so slight. Again, I stress that I'm being a complete pixel peeping nerd. But yeah, it's slightly softer out towards the longer end of the range. Um, no, the shot was not handheld and uh, it was all on a stable surface. It was uh, done with the self timer enabled. So sometimes, yeah, I did see a little bit of softness there. Um, I don't know if it's like a focus thing or not. I mean, I shot a lot with the lens. Um, it kind of reminds me of Tamron's 28 to 75 when it first came out, how it kind of missed focus a little bit until they did that firmware update.
Normally I test more than one copy of the lens. I'm going to have to try another copy too and see what happens. But yeah, not bad at all unless you're really, really being a pixel peeping maniac. But it is definitely sharper towards the middle of the range and towards the wide end of the range. So again, this is at 86 millimeters. In my humble opinion, it certainly looks better than when we're all the way out at 150. At 150, it's just not quite as crisp. So then I looked at bokeh as well. So a quick little comparison there. Um, shot with the 85 1.4 G Master at 2.8 and then this lens at 2.8. And the short answer is, bokeh wise, I think, I think the Sigma, sorry, I think the Tamron, um, I've been testing too many lenses lately. lately. I think the Tamron looks really good uh, here on the left. It is really hard to compare. Uh, it's hard to see a difference, you know, between both these two lenses. The G Master 85 1.4 is one of the best lenses for bokeh. And uh, yeah, if you just showed me these images, I would not know what shot what. So really good there as well. Now, that softness I spoke of at 150 is not something that's really noticeable in the real world. Uh, here's a quick shot of my buddy Joe. And you'll notice here, I'm shooting again. You know, wide open, 150 millimeters. And whenever we go and kind of look at a close, take a close look here, you guys can see, I mean, I mean, Joe, Joe looks pretty sharp. As he should. I mean, he's a, he's a pretty sharp guy. So, yeah, I mean looks great in the real world so again unless you're being a pixel peeping nerd you're not going to see that bit of softness at 150. Uh, I also noticed that this lens did really really well hand holding the IBIS in the uh, Sony A1 did a good job <clears throat> I was able to consistently get down to about an eighth of a second hand held and get some good shots here so you guys can notice here if we zoom in I mean, this is all handheld at an eighty. Uh, sorry, at an eighth uh, of a second. So, really good, really good showing by the lens there. Uh, in the real world, I wouldn't shoot much slower than about one sixtieth of a second or so. But knowing that I can go this uh, this low with this lens, definitely, definitely makes a difference. Um, anyways, just kind of a quick look at what I've sort of captured so far. Certainly, write me in the comments below. Let me know what other type of testing you'd like to see. Uh, certainly, I'd love to get this lens out and do something more exciting than take photographs in my kitchen at 11.30 at night with it. Um, I'd love to get maybe some studio shots in, uh, perhaps also do some outdoor portraiture as well. Uh, and I definitely want to see how the lens holds up in the edges. But if there's anything else you guys are thinking of, write me in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, be sure to share it with anyone you think it's used that will find it useful. And also don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, this is Jeremy Smith signing off. That's how I get loosened up. Okay.